Let's take a look in this lecture at gas-liquid PV diagrams. Let me start with a PV diagram for carbon dioxide. So what is a PV diagram? It is a plot of pressure, in this case in units of atmospheres on the y-axis, and molar volume in units of liters per mole on the x-axis. And shown on the plot itself are so-called isotherms. That is, it is a plot of P versus V bar at constant temperature. That's what isotherm means, at a constant temperature. So the highest temperature on here in degrees Celsius, 47.8 degrees Celsius, and then we drop to 36.2, 32, and so on, 22.6, 13.2 degrees C. So there's a few interesting features on this plot I want to call to your attention. One is this horizontal behavior of some of the lines. So let's think about what you're actually, you might be doing in an experiment. Let's say again that I've got a container and I've got a piston. And I'm pressing harder and harder with my piston. And so what I would expect to happen if I'm starting over here on the right-hand side at a low pressure, at a low pressure I would expect a larger molar volume. Right? I am able to have more volume per mole because I'm not pressing on it so hard. So as I press, the molar volume should go down. And so I'm pressing higher and higher pressure and the volume's going down, down, down. And then suddenly my pressure stays constant for quite a while while the molar volume goes down, 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 down. And remember, the relationship between molar volume and density is inverse. So if the molar volume is going down, the density is going up. So this is the situation I described in the last lecture. I'm liquefying my gas. So when you see this kind of behavior, where there is a sudden change in the slope of the line, it's basically a non-differentiable point in that line, it remains horizontal for a period of time, and then suddenly the relationship between pressure and molar volume shoots up. And that's because liquids are very incompressible. So to get a smaller molar volume takes an enormously larger amount of pressure. Now if I raise the temperature from 13.2 degrees to 22.6 degrees in this case, well, I can press to a higher pressure before, and a smaller molar volume, before I again see that horizontal behavior take place. Over which time period, I'll liquefy the gas. And if I were to connect up all of these discontinuity points, that's what this dotted line is. If there were many, many isotherms, the dotted line would follow the uh, discontinuities. And we call that the coexistence curve. That is, it marks the edges of a region of pressure and molar volume where the two phases coexist, both liquid and gas. And the right-hand side tells you what's the molar volume, or the density, of the gas during that compression period. And the left-hand side tells you what's the molar volume of the liquid during that period. Of course, after you've got a pure phase on one side or the other, the molar volume will again become sensitive to the pressure. But during that period, as one phase transforms to the other, you've got both, and they have their specific molar volumes. Now, notice what happens as I trace the coexistence curve up, 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 up. At some point, it turns over. That is, there is a point where one isotherm just kisses the very top of the coexistence curve. That is called the critical temperature. It is the temperature above which you cannot liquefy a gas anymore. Doesn't matter how much you press on it, it will never be in the liquid phase. So a term to remember, the critical temperature. So as the temperature approaches the critical temperature, the curve flattens and you get this point of inflection, essentially. And then at T below the critical temperature, uh, you see horizontal regions where gas and liquid coexist. So remembering these different regions is critical to understanding a PV diagram. So how do non-ideal cubic equations of state do for that? So here's the van der Waals equation of state plotted for carbon dioxide. I'm going to use the A and B parameters specific to carbon dioxide. At various temperatures, I will plot these isotherms on a PV diagram. And what I see is that at the higher temperatures, that looks pretty similar to what we saw in the last PV diagram. And sure enough, as I lower the temperature, I start to see this flattening effect. And it looks as though I'm getting to some kind of a point of inflection. 
And then it does something a little odd. It actually rolls over, drops for a little while, and then goes up again, as, as they all should at this side, right? The, takes a lot of pressure to compress a liquid. So this is reasonable behavior, and, and really, why is that? So I mentioned in an earlier lecture, if I were to rearrange the van der Waals equation in order to express it with molar volume taken to positive powers instead of appearing in denominators, this would be the correct expression. It's v bar cubed minus quantity b plus rt over p times v bar squared plus a over p v bar minus a constant ab divided by p equals zero. So that is a cubic equation. And we know what cubic equations look like. They, well, they look kind of like this, actually. And it can rise, dip, and rise again. Uh, and under certain circumstances, maybe there is a point of inflection. So it, it's understandable why a cubic equation might be capable of reproducing this physical behavior. And it turns out, uh, I'm not going to show you the equations, but the redlich Kwong and the Peng-Robinson can similarly be rewritten as cubic equations in the molar volume. And they show similar behavior in terms of being able to match PV isotherms. So let me take a, a little bit closer look at the process and remind you of what happened in a real PV diagram. In a real PV diagram, if I start at a lower pressure and a large molar volume, as I increase pressure, the molar volume drops and drops as I'm compressing. And then I would reach some point at which, in principle, the pressure remained constant while the volume continued to drop. And then finally, I would have transformed gas at this point to liquid at this point, And I would rise substantially in pressure. What we see with the cubic equation of state is so-called van der Waals loops. These are unrealistic. Why are they unrealistic? Well, think about what that slope of that line there in the uh, isotherm means. The slope would be the change in pressure divided by the change in molar volume. And in this case, it is positive. Right? It's actually saying that as I increase the pressure, I increase the molar volume. That's what it takes to have a positive slope. And that doesn't make any sense at all. As I increase the pressure on something, I ought to decrease its molar volume. So that's a flaw in the equation of state. I'll also note, uh, I. I called out these points A and D and said, here's where we would see the transformation from gas to liquid. And one might ask, why there? I could have drawn this line down here. I could have drawn it up here. So you can make thermodynamic arguments that I, I don't actually want to detour off to derive, but something called the Maxwell equal area construction. If you place the line where the area above the line is equal to the area below the line, that's a pretty good estimate of where the coexistence curve will be passing through. Now, one of the points I want to make about this cubic equation of state is that because it's a cubic equation, at least at a temperature like this, there are three roots to this polynomial cubic equation. And they're all real roots. But as the temperature goes closer and closer to the critical temperature, the positions of the roots, so if I look at uh, roots here, would be, for instance, here and here and here, right? They cross an axis. The cubic equation crosses an axis. But if I get to the point where instead of going up, down, I go to a point of inflection, that's equivalent to all of the roots converging on a single triply degenerate root. And that happens at the critical temperature, which is to say that the cubic equation at that point is molar volume minus the critical molar volume. So that's the molar volume at the critical temperature. Cubed is equal to 0, right? It's a triply degenerate root. V is Vc. V bar is V bar C, that is. So let me just expand out that cubic equation, that very simple one, V bar minus V bar C cubed. So all I did was cube that expression. And so I'll get v bar cubed minus 3 v bar c v bar squared plus and so on. And the nice thing about that is, let me just compare here. I've got v cubed compares to v cubed. Here's a term in v bar squared. So I can relate 3 times the critical molar volume to b plus rt over p. And I can relate 3 v bar c squared to a over p. And Evidently, v bar c cubed is a b over p. So 
if I have this relationship between the two equations and I do the algebra required to actually solve for the critical volume, the critical pressure, and the critical temperature, I get these expressions. So I'll let you do the algebra for yourself if you'd like to. There's a whole lot of you know, pushing terms around. But the bottom line is the critical volume, critical molar volume, is 3 times B. The critical pressure is A over 27B squared. And the critical temperature is 8A over 27 times B times the universal gas constant. And that actually is where these parameters in the van der Waals equations of state come from. So they're not just plucked out of thin air. They're not just necessarily uh, played around with until they seem to fit some set of experimental data. Instead, you do experiments required to get at the, uh, the critical properties, the critical pressure, the critical temperature, the critical volume. And once you have those in hand, you select the A and B parameters that best reproduce the experimental data. And so if we just want to take a look at a few of those uh, data, I've, I've tabulated some of them here, helium, neon, argon, krypton, uh, hydrogen. So these are, these are the uh, noble gases increasing in size and mass. And then molecular hydrogen and carbon dioxide. And so these are the critical temperatures. Notice that helium's critical temperature is only 5.2, roughly, degrees Kelvin. So above 5 degrees Kelvin, that's only 5 degrees above absolute zero, you cannot liquefy helium. So if you hear someone refer to liquid helium, it is a very cold substance. It's typically about 4 degrees Kelvin, actually. Uh, neon has a higher critical temperature, 44. Argon, 151. Krypton is actually starting to get closer to room temperature. Molecular hydrogen, again, very cold, the critical temperature. Carbon dioxide, 304.14 degrees. I'm sorry, don't say degrees because it's Kelvin. Kelvin. So that's above room temperature, in fact. And one can also look at the critical pressures expressed in bar or atmosphere, the relevant molar volumes. They're a little bit less interesting. And then over here is the compressibility at the critical temperature. So remember the compressibility Z. That was PV bar over RT. And now we're in the specific instance where critical pressure, critical volume, molar volume, and critical temperature are the relevant P, V bar, and T. And notice something kind of interesting here. Although there's enormous variation in these numbers, the critical temperature, the critical pressure, the critical volume, the compressibility actually spans a fairly small range. It looks like the smallest one is about 0.274. The largest one is 0.304. That's only about a 10% range in compressibility. Why might that be? Well, actually, now that we know how to relate the van der Waals parameters to the critical properties. Let's plug that in. That is, here's R. R is always R. Let's just take out the 1 over R. And we'll replace the critical pressure with its expression using van der Waals parameters. We'll replace the critical molar volume with its expression. And finally, we'll replace the critical temperature with its expression, 1 over that, because the critical temperature is in the denominator. When you do that, let, let's just see here. I got a b squared down the denominator. I've got two b's up here, so that's b squared. They all cancel out. I've got an a in the numerator. I've got an a in the denominator. They all cancel out. After that, it's a little bit of arithmetic with numbers. Oh, actually, the 27 cancels out the 27. Uh, and the r cancels out the r. I'm left with 3 divided by 8. I do not even need a calculator to do that. 3 divided by 8, 0 0.375. Not factorial, but an exclamation point. That's amazing. It says that for every gas, at least within the van der Waals equation of state approximation, the critical compressibility is a constant. It's 0 0.375. Now, in fact, if we refer back to this column, it's not 0 0.375, but it's not that far. So there's an apparent correspondence between different real gases that's independent of the van der Waals equation of state. Right? I've I've not really invoked any parameters. I canceled them all out. Uh, and that is known as a, a correspondence property. And that's really quite an interesting thing, I would say. So let's pause for a moment. And I'll give you a chance to recapitulate what you've picked up about van der Waals parameters. And then we'll pick back up. 
All right, so you've come to appreciate how attractive and repulsive forces uh, play a role in the Van der Waals equation of state. Let's uh, next spend a little bit of time looking at the law of corresponding states that I've uh, provided some foreshadowing of in the last slide on this lecture. But prior to doing that, since I've shown you the PV diagram for carbon dioxide, let's take a little time off and we'll do a demonstration of carbon dioxide under various pressures. We'll look at the triple point and explore some other features of this interesting substance. In this course, we won't have time to examine so-called phase diagrams in detail. But in discussing gases, we've had a chance to at least discuss vapor-liquid coexistence curves and critical temperatures. And in one of the very first lectures, I mentioned the widespread use of supercritical carbon dioxide in the dry cleaning industry as a green alternative to chlorocarbon solvents that used to be used. So in this demonstration, I'd like to illustrate properties of carbon dioxide, some of which are relevant to our discussion of gas and liquid properties. To begin, let's add some dry ice to this plastic bottle. If we now seal the bottle tightly and warm it a bit, the dry ice will sublime, increasing the amount of gaseous CO2 and, given the fixed volume, also increasing the pressure. As the pressure grows, we eventually come to the point where some of the gas liquefies. At this stage, we have solid, liquid, and gaseous CO2 all in equilibrium with one another. And this is called the triple point because all three phases are present simultaneously. It occurs at a precise temperature and pressure, neither of which is particularly extreme for CO2. About five atmospheres pressure and a temperature of minus 56.6 degrees Celsius. Can you see the liquid and solid phases? And of course, we can't see the gas, but it is there in the apparent void volume. In the next demonstration, I'd like to illustrate the critical temperature for CO2, which you recall is the temperature beyond which the gas cannot be compressed to a liquid at any pressure. And indeed, we stop calling the substance a gas and call it a supercritical fluid. For CO2, the critical point occurs at about 73 atmospheres and 31.1 degrees Celsius. So here, I have a sealed tube containing carbon dioxide at high pressure. As room temperature is a bit below 31.1 degrees Celsius, there's clearly a liquid phase, and you can see that by observation of the meniscus, that is, the boundary between the liquid and the gaseous phases that we see more clearly because of the change in index of refraction across the phase boundary. Now let's gently heat the tube with this economical substitute for a heat gun namely a hair dryer. Keep an eye on the meniscus. Do you see how it's starting to disappear? As I warm the tube past the critical temperature, the carbon dioxide becomes supercritical and I can no longer discern two phases. Now, an interesting thing about the critical point is that as it is approached from above in temperature, one often observes a phenomenon known as opalescence. The condensation of gas to liquid that occurs everywhere in the tube leads to very small suspended drops that scatter light beautifully until a new liquid phase is formed. So let's watch carefully as the tube cools. There, do you see the opalescence beginning? And as it fades, do you see the liquid phase increasing in volume and the meniscus rising up the tube? As supercritical fluids go, carbon dioxide is relatively easy to work with because the pressures and temperatures involved are not especially extreme. And the characteristics of CO2 as a solvent are useful for a surprising number of things. 
in addition to dry cleaning, supercritical CO2 extraction is now one of the two most widely used methods to decaffeinate coffee and tea. Indeed, Numi Tea Company calls its supercritical carbon dioxide process an organic use of effervescence and further calls the process chemical free. Such chemophobia can only make one shake one's head, but now you've seen a supercritical fluid for yourself and we'll look more at critical constants in the lectures.